I'm live and fuzzy because I have one of those uh, webcams that are autofocus. Um, <laughs> it's decided to not have been focused. Good start. Right. Okay. So, um, hi and welcome to another live stream. Thank you for joining us. If you want to make a comment, that's great. We have uh, Coop's Kitchen already saying greetings from Alaska. So when Rich comes on, uh, I will put him on the stream and then I'll try and sort my ult autofocus camera out. I have got a, um, a cup of uh, decaf coffee, so that's probably going to get me in trouble. Oh, hello. We're back in focus. Right, let's get Richard in and Richard can say his hellos. Hello. To anyone that's watching, actually. Hello, everyone who's watching. <laughs> and I'm on time. I'm on time. You are on time. So, what's that badge on your sweatshirt? Oh, that's um, Ferry Flatliners. That's the club to this side. That's the club. The club? That, um, it's called the Ferry Flatliners. So, that's the local club that I've been running uh, and cycling with. So, there we are. Big shout out to the Flatliners. So what yeah. what you've been doing this week activity wise? Have you been running three times a week or no? It's my training is absolutely awful at the moment. Um, unfortunately, work is taking over big time. Um, I'm working stupid amounts of hours every day. So my train. So I'm I'm literally running and riding once a week, and that's not enough. Um, but yeah. It, uh, so this weekend, what, what I've done today, uh, I was working shop yesterday on Saturday, but today I've jumped on uh, on on Zwift to do a little blast on there. But I've had nothing but issues on there, which is really frustrating. Um, it kept losing signal, so I ended up doing like four different sessions to make up one session. But yeah, the yeah. joys, the joys of self-employment. <laughs> yes, uh, but the thing is, you know. You are your own boss, so you can sack yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then you can employ yourself again. Um, just a few people saying hello. So this, uh, I always say this one wrong. How would you say that name? Primal. Primal. How would you say that? Primal Mike, maybe. All right, yeah. okay. Yeah, I like yeah. it. Very so much. yeah, I like it. Yeah. It's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's good. I'll have to keep practicing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So just uh, Art Master Studio TV. Hi. Hello. I paint in uh, watercolors and oils occasionally. And uh, I might show you a bit of my work. If that really is an arty person there. And good old Matthew coming in from Norwich. How was, are we going, Matthew? Okay. Yeah. Good support. The home Matthew. of Alan Partridge, that is, isn't it, Norwich? Anyway, uh, and Delia Smith's football team, Norwich. Do you know that? No, no. I do, it's You're not no. a fan, are you? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've um, my my father left when when I was three, so I was brought up in a house full of three women, basically. So, uh, yeah, sport wasn't a thing at all. No football, no rugby, um, uh, nothing. Yeah, I I was absolutely useless and super unfit growing up. Um, I left school at seven stone. I the opposite to being sporty and athletic, uh, which shocks a lot of people, I think, because of what I do now. But um mm. yeah, that's where I came from. So <laughs> and, and without being too philosophical, then do you feel that you um suffered because you didn't have a dad around? Do you think that in Wales fathers are the biggest sort of influence? Um it, it's, when it comes to, to sports, for sure. Mm. So um yeah i don't know if i should say it's just in case she, i don't think she's listening but let's hope she isn't my mother isn't the most maternal um it was you know kick you out and go and play early in the morning and come back for tea um yeah so yeah i never never had that motherly figure really either um yeah oh no we're gonna yeah. start on a really sad note here <laughs> but yeah i i i I mean, I've got two degrees. I've got an honours degree in English literature and an honours degree in uh, physiology and health sciences. My my dad died when I was 10, and there was nobody in our family ever went to university. And my mum was so not academic, you would not believe it, which is not 
being disrespectful, but I lost her in my twenties. So um, they never got to see me be educated. But there you go. I left school. I, I was a bit of a tear away actually. I left school with no qualifications. Did all my qualifications after school. Um, right. Let's go through these messages very quickly. Uh, sorry for the nickname. T F C Locks. Tom. That's Tom. All right. Let's see if we can remember that. Good evening, Tom. And we've got uh, Jenna from Germany, which is good. What's the weather like in Germany? I wonder. Um, let's be having you. <laughs> isn't that what? Isn't isn't that the avenue where police police officers live? Let's be avenue. Right. Uh, anyway, forget that. And there's um, Jonathan. Good old, good old Jonathan. Have to get him on as a guest some point, won't we? Definitely. Definitely. Southern California. Oh, hello. Yes. That's Emma. Or just M. That's very good. And you've got Copper's Kitchen saying they'll adopt you. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> right. Look at this. Yes. Competition consultant. Nice to see you. So, yeah, it's good that people know each other in this community. And, uh, Sunny is from the US, but I wonder what part, please don't say all of her, but um, <laughs> I wonder what part of the state Sunny is from. And last one, last, last hello, I think. Uh, how would you say that? Vitalitis? Uh, Dad died at 15 and my mum is the same as yours. Yeah, but yeah, my mum was just basically, she was just happy. You know, she liked looking at a blue sky and flowers and stuff like that. Hello from Memphis. We're not really talking very carnivore at the moment, are we? Uh, but that's good. It's good to do this. Background stories, isn't it? Yeah. Background. Mississippi. Mississippi. Look at that. Like life before carnivore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, so we've got Mike. On the topic of education, I'm an electrical engineer. I want to learn about human physiology and metabolism. Is there any courses, websites you can recommend to obtain correct education? Right. I'm going to be really frank here. When I did my honours degree, which was very recent, um, you have to take the nutrition side with a pinch of salt. You really do. And uh, same with my advanced, per advanced personal training. And when I did my obesity and diabetes training, low carbs, not in there. Not really. I mean, it's in a book. It's there. It's mentioned, but it's, you know, um, I'm not really being very positive here. And I do apologize for that because I'm not very positive about the answer. I think the best education you can get is um, hearing as many different sources as you can, reading as many different things as you can, hearing firsthand from people. And then um, basically... Uh, trying to sort out the wheat from the chaff, which is what you do anyway. When, say, for instance, if you're looking at a study and you look at the conclusion and then you look at the data, I would literally say 95% of the time in nutrition science, and that's being generous, 95% of the time, it is a waste of time reading the conclusion because it doesn't relate to the data at all. So that's, so we're saying this probably 5% is good, is actually optimistic all right so it could be worse than that um but i think you know the, the basis of physiology is pretty solid you know um if you can understand neurotransmitters in the skeleton and muscles and atp production once you get into it you'll realize this it's very frustrating and i'm being quite polite here because I, I would say that when I did my degree, um, there were some very helpful things, but I only really was able to read between the lines because I'd lived the experience of doing rehab and, and, and you know, being around people and seeing the difference. So I was able to say, yeah, actually, when they start talking about um, descending pathways, which modulates pain, for instance, I know that's true. I know that that works. So it's quite nice to know the chemistry and, and what happens when someone is in pain and how you can relieve that pain to actually be able to describe it to someone. So, um, yeah, the answer is I would get something like Guyton's Medical Physiology textbook and I would read it. <laughs> I would simply read the textbook because that's not going to have a an opinion, really. I mean, it does sort of 
postulate some sort of opinions, but in the main, it just tells you the facts. So that's Guyton's Medical Physiology Textbook. Now, that might cost you 100 quid, all right, because it's difficult to get, um, but it would be cheaper than all the courses put together, and you'd learn more, definitely. So, uh, right, let's have a look. I mean, you could listen to Rich. I mean, to be honest, right, if you listen to, say, Rich and, and Chafee for three hours and took some notes, um, someone like Michael Eads, uh, who else would I recommend is very good, uh, Amber O'Hearn. You know, if you really want to get into the weeds, they're very good. They're very, very good with, with that sort of stuff. Hello, Massachusetts. Um, which always makes me think of the Bee Gees song. Uh, or a very bad joke about a big pile of dentures, a mass of two sets. All right, here we go. Oh, here we go. Some, some, uh, Ayana, look at that. Keto Pro just did an eight and a half mile run. Fantastic. That's yeah, great. she's working towards um, a half marathon coming up shortly. <clears throat> so, yeah, be interesting to see how, um, how that pans out. Hope the training's going well. Uh, maybe you can chuck an update uh, in the comments. I know that um, we've been exchanging a few messages back and forth, but it'd be nice for, for everyone to hear about the progress with, with your running. Um, yeah, coming from a, a weightlifting background, similar to myself. Um, Is Ayana worried about the time? I mean, you obviously knew she was doing this. Is she worried about the pace or just finishing? It'd be interesting to find out, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, when I came into the run-in, um, people thought that I was going to be fit because of what I did. Um, I couldn't run one and a half K and I would, I regarded myself as being a fit person. Uh, it's just completely different training. So it, you know, I literally quite literally had to start from scratch. I was never one of these people that did, uh, the weightlifting and cardio. Um, they both, uh, counterintuitive to each other. Uh, if you want to build muscle, um still lifting brilliant if you want to build muscle then you know the cardio is um i can hear you grinning in the background there um cardio is counterintuitive you've given the body two different signals that's you see people in the gym who will hit the weights for an hour um which is plenty because you don't uh, increase cortisol to the level that you become catabolic and then they'll go run in which is undoing a lot of the hard work um the m2 activation that you've just done in the gym so if you are going to mix the weight training and the cardio you need to either do it on separate days or at opposite ends of the day i.e one in the morning and one later in the day you shouldn't do both together uh, but i didn't do i didn't do any cardio for my cutting uh, it was all done through diet and lifestyle uh, macro manipulation uh, i just uh, manipulated my macros in order to cut down to you know single figure two percent body fat um at the peak but um yeah, so running was new to me. So this is why it, it's, it's a bit, you know, quite a big thing coming from a weightlifting background going into, into running. People, I think, just have this pre-conceived uh, conception of, you know, just because you, you train in the gym that you're going to be instantly good at running. And, <clears throat> yeah, it, that's not the case. At least it wasn't for me. So no, I think I can back that up, actually. So I always say about cross-canceling, which is, um, you know, if you're building muscle and then you're doing endurance running, you're building a muscle, then you're tearing it down, you know, cross-canceling. So anyway, yeah, but the thing you just said really hit a nerve is when I was doing my running and I was preparing for a half marathon and then later for a marathon, you think I was really fit. And one of the guys there said, oh, you're quite handy at soccer. Do you want to come along to some five-a-side? Yep, fine. I haven't played five aside for 15 years. I will do that. And within five minutes, I was absolutely out. <laughs> absolutely. Completely different fitness. And I can remember him saying, I, I thought you were super fit because I was one of the fastest people in the running group. It was a big group. Um, not the fastest, but, you know, I was all there or thereabouts and always the one with the most stamina. And uh, he actually was much younger. So I was in my 40s, I guess early 40s, maybe late 30s, and he was in his 20s. And he used me to pace himself in his first race. You know, but he didn't tell me this. He just said, you know, I, I use you as my pacer because you're about the pace I want to be, which was a compliment. Anyway, five minutes into this football, or soccer, I should say, for the people in the States. Um, yeah, I just was flat on my back saying, I really need to train for soccer, which is something I know as a personal trainer. Um, quite a weird thing, Rich, is Beth is from Ilkeston, which is 
where I am. So that's interesting. I did not know that. Uh, right, here we go. Uh, Mike, I mostly listen to podcasts from people like you. Good, thank you. Or it could, be, it could mean rich, by the way. Uh, Chafee and Kilts and reading books from people like them. Yeah, I mean, that's the best thing, just to expose yourself to. I think sometimes it's really good to see the other side, the other point of view, because mm. you can then think to yourself, well, why are they saying that? I mean, Sean Baker is very good at being sent videos and then commenting and saying, did you see what that guy just said about uh, acid reflux was his one today? And he's categorically said that eating meat will not help you with acid reflux. And of course, I've probably got at least 100 people that reversed acid reflux and Sean Beer being a much bigger fish has probably got thousands. Um, so firstly, that's painfully not true then. So this person is, is saying, them, calling themselves the acid, acid reflux guy, didn't know that actually he was talking rubbish. And then he said, there's no argument about fiber. You have to have fiber, period. That's it. There's no... There's no, there's nothing to even talk about. You have to have fiber. Then gave a couple of reasons why you have to have fiber, and, and Sean just ripped it apart. Now that's how you learn as well, because let's say that person said something you'd not heard, and it sounded well. That makes a bit of sense. Then you dive into that and dig into it and see well, where's your evidence for that, you know. And then um, that gives you more knowledge, really, because it it would just open your eyes to different. Uh, theories yeah i completely agree and i mean coming the few points there coming on to the acid reflux um most acid reflux is caused by lectins and a lot of foods that you eat with fibrin contain lectins the lectins will bind to mast cells and cause a release of histamine which leads to acid reflux so saying that you need fiber is probably absolutely counterintuitive as most foods that contain fiber contain lectins um I used to suffer with severe acid reflux. Uh, a lot of mine was probably alcohol induced <laughs> when I used to drink a lot. <laughs> um, but when when I did, um, which contains greens, when I did uh, cut that out, I noticed that um, the food that I was eating, the muesli, and you know when I was trying to be healthy, uh, you know the muesli that I was eating every day would also give me acid reflux. And it was not until years and years later that I discovered that it was actually the lectins within that uh, muesli that was giving me that acid reflux. And just to circle back to a point you made there in regards to um, uh, looking at conflicting evidence, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to listen to that podcast yet, Steve, the one that um, Dr. Chafee and I released with Do Georgie Dinkoff and McCola. Um, you know, I took that seriously because he was, um, he had a counter opinion to everything that I thought that I knew. So uh, a client of mine sent it to me and asked me if there was any value in it uh, or any truth. So I went through it with uh, a fine tooth comb eventually. Um, the, the first time that I looked at it, I spent about 10 minutes and felt like I'd ripped it apart, but um, went through it with a fine tooth, tooth comb. And then um, I asked uh, Dr. Chafee if he wanted to do uh, a co-podcast and go through those points one by one. Um, and I think we comfortably, for anybody that's watched, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but I think we comfortably uh, ripped apart um, any of those uh, concerns about long-term ketosis and low-carb being detrimental to your health. But it was very good because sometimes you need those things to keep you in check because, you know, uh, same, same with you, Steve. You know, the last thing you want to be doing is giving out bad advice. Um now, we've lived the lifestyle. It's allowed us to improve health and well-being beyond all comprehension, uh, everybody we work with. But still, you always feel, you know, am I giving the correct advice? Should I be saying these things? Does meat cause cancer? You know, all of these sorts of things keep keep rearing the heads. So we keep looking at that information. And, and that's the difference, I think, between our group Um and, and I say our group as in the carnivore community because we do we do look at other evidence. Whereas what I seem the impression that I get is outside of that community, uh, a lot of others have their opinion. You know, as in fiber is is required you know, for one. I can't remember the last time I had fiber, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. not from a plant at least. Um, I find that they are stuck in their ways and you know they're not willing to look at both sides of the evidence but i pride myself on that if anybody has counter evidence i i will gladly go through any um you know research papers and and, and you know to the nth degree to get to, to the truth because i'm in this for optimal health 
I'm in this for optimal you know, health and well-being. I want to be the fittest and healthiest that I can be. And everybody that I give that advice to, I, I want to reap the benefits of. So if there's anything counter to that, then I want to know about it, you know. Um, if something came out tomorrow and said that introducing carbohydrate was beneficial for any reason, I would take that study seriously and I would look into it. But every one that I've seen as in regards to the influences that have popped up saying that, you know, honey is good for you and, and all these other <laughs> things that you need, carb refeeds, I, I can't find any truth in that. Or one of them we referenced in this talk, um, but it, yeah, but still... We're still open to that suggestion. We're still open to looking into that research. And I love getting into the weeds and looking into that research. And to date, I can honestly say that living this lifestyle, I genuinely believe to be the healthiest way to live. Um, and as far as fiber goes, we get fiber from animals. We get fiber from animals. Plants contain fiber and it breaks down into something called butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid, which feeds the colonocytes in the gut. And that's true. Um, but animal proteins also contain fiber. They contain animal fiber in, in the form of isobutrate, isovalerate, and papyonate, which break into short chain fatty acid, which feeds the gut microbes, the colonocytes in the gut at a higher rate than the fiber from plants. So we don't need plant fiber. Animal fiber is, is all we need. Yeah, and you, and you get the isobutyrate from the blood side, which actually cuts out about three steps. So going back to that person wanting to learn, you see, Rich has got all the knowledge there. I have, uh, I literally yes. have a playlist on my YouTube, which is all about the science, bite-sized, easy bits. So, and there's there's plenty of um, plenty of influences you could look at. Uh, yeah, and in Ayana, who we were talking about there doing the run. I mean, she uh, one of the reasons I absolutely love her coming on the channel, and and we did do an interview, but also she likes to pick my brains apart or not so much now uh possibly found somebody else a bit more interesting maybe you rich i don't know but um <laughs> if you more can't chance. be questioned if you can't be questioned and that's this is a bit of advice if you've got someone online and they have blocked out comments or only will allow comments from people they've approved then i would actually not entertain their opinion because you know, what, what's it? Uh, one of the quotes is, um, I would rather have questions that can't be answered rather than answers that can't be questioned, All right, which I think is a really good phrase for the last three, four years. If you can't question someone's science, if you're not allowed to question it, then they're not on solid ground. <clears throat> question you know, if Rich and I came on and said, right, well, you know, if behind the scenes we said, well, there's going to be a question. If we don't really like it or can't answer it, we'll just pretend we've not seen it you know that that's ridiculous which is why i'd like to go for every single comment because we should i think but we've know. done it we've done it previously even we we've been asked questions that we didn't know the answer to yeah you know and we've we've openly said you know we've maybe got an opinion or an idea but to be honest it's not something that we've looked into or either looked into and can't remember um hmm. but i think we, we're always open in regards to to answers to questions and whether we you know we have an opinion or, or an answer for it isn't it um, yeah, nice segue to this quick question from Kyle. It says, Richard, you made a post about calcium in electrolytes isn't good. I use Redmond's uh, Relight. It has 16 milligrams of calcium carbonate per serving. Should I be concerned about that? No, I wouldn't be overly concerned. It um, it depends on what you take in, obviously, but it... Uh... One of the studies that I reference in that in that video, and uh, maybe I should do another one and go into a lot more depth. That's an entire different subject by itself, but I try to cram that into into a short five minute video. But excess calcium consumption increases cardiovascular disease, or reportedly by up to fifteen percent, which is a massive increase. Calcium is essential, but being carnivore, everything we consume contains it lots and lots of calcium. It doesn't take an awful lot to get to the optimal level of calcium. Um, so we just, th this is why I don't add it to my electrolytes because I feel that we consume enough. Uh, and what I want to be careful is that we don't over consume in regards to calcium supplementation, but um, 60 milligrams, I mean, it, it depends how much you take in. Um, I wouldn't be overly concerned, you know, with, with 60. Some of these supplements you see in the market have got a couple of hundred, anything over a thousand milligrams per day, uh, either through dietary calcium or supplementation of calcium has been shown to increase that uh, risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, but what that's calcium? Gonna be what about the fact it's calcium carbonate? I mean, I was led to believe calcium carbonate is not really that bioavailable anyway. Yeah. 
Yeah, it isn't. Um, but again, it's you know we, how much calcium are we consuming through through diet, through yeah. natural source? It, it's an awful lot. And calcium, we don't want calcium circulating the body. It's got to be sent to where it needs to go. Um, and then that's where we look into the the, the K vitamins, isn't it? People supplement with vitamin K two uh, and D three, um, which are fat soluble vitamins, by the way. Um, which when a segue off this really really quickly, but people will take these supplements while on a low fat diet, but these are fat soluble vitamins. We need the fat to be able to assimilate those, 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 you know, those, those nutrients. There's a clue there, isn't there? There's a clue there in the name. Yeah, exactly. So it, um, you know, I, I'm, no, I, I own a supplement store. Uh, I make supplements. Um, but I class the supplements I make as foods because there's nothing artificial in there. It's all clean. Uh, they're zero VAT rated, so they come under under that umbrella. But I'm I'm all for supplementation if it's going to give you an improvement or an advantage. Um, but in regards to multivitamins um, uh, and other supplementations, you know, I I don't think that we need them. Um, the argument for electrolytes on a carnivore diet is that we uh, so so some a question that I had. Basically, I'll answer this and I'll go into what I was going to say. I don't I wouldn't be concerned with sixty milligrams in in your um, your Redmond. Um, I, th I think that'll be okay. Um, moving on from that really quickly. And I've forgotten where I was going. So <laughs> <laughs> I knew it I makes you forgetful. <laughs> if you, <laughs> I, knew, I knew I shouldn't have stopped with that one. Don't yeah. worry. Don't worry. It'll, don't worry. it'll come back. It'll, it'll come back. <laughs> By the way, I was showing that if people want to go to your website and they haven't ordered before, you get 10% off with the code keto new 10. You get 10 and, and I just remembered. I just remembered. I told you to Good. come back. Good. So that's that's the ketones working, the BHB. Um, so a question that I was asked recently is that, um, you know, why do you need salt or electrolytes live in a carnivore lifestyle if it's meant to be optimal? Um, and, and the answer to that is, well, you know, are you eating organ meats? Um, are you eating fish that you've caught from the sea? Are you drinking puddle water? Are you storing your meats on, on you know, rocks, you know, before cooking it? Um is it in the sand, you know, picking up all of these little bits? Are you boiling your bones and creating bone broth? Because this, these are the things that we would have done, um, you know, for, for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. We would have eaten everything within that animal. And typically these days, you know, what are we eating? Bacon and eggs uh, and sausages. And, and all those things are fine. But it's, you're not eating, a lot of us don't eat organ meats. A lot of us are not using bone broth. We're not boiling the bones down. We're not getting the electrolytes from the bones um, and we're certainly not storing our meats, you know, in, in, in the dirt on the floor, which is, you know, in puddle water and all that sorts of stuff. Um, so we need salt. Salt is super important. Um, I find that supplementation is a fantastic way. Um, but I also do all of the other things. I, I know I use bone broth. Uh, I use collagen. I don't boil my bones, but because I'm too lazy, uh, I have done, but it's, I, I'm just too short, a t too short a time. And we are bring in in a, a brand um broil and broth i think it's called um is that the right we had the owner rachel on on the 24 hour carnivoreathon is it boil broil and broth yeah boil and broth yeah yeah so we're um i've, I've kind of had uh some samples fantastic product um i look forward to a cup of that every night as it happens so i sit by my window with a cup of, of bone broth um, fantastic way to get electrolytes in as well as, uh, you know, all the collagen fibers and everything else that we need. Um, but yeah, a little segue there in, into, into regards to why electrolytes in our diet from some form or another are really important and why, you know, typically live in a carnivore or ketogenic lifestyle, we don't get enough of them. We, we're not boiling our bones. We're not boiling mm. our bones. And I think this is, you know, um, the big issue that Paul Saladino didn't really address when he was carnivore and then felt that he was having cramps and fatigue and heart palpitations because uh, it it would possibly be alleviated by an increase in sodium because once you get that water weight go, uh, it takes out a lot of sodium as well. So you've got the sodium loss from a ketogenic diet. And if you start to increase your salt intake, for many people, that does get rid of those fatigue, palpitations, cramps, and those sort of things. Um, and, uh, you know, he, anyway, we, I don't want to get into that. So let's let's get into the next question. Let's get into the next question. I liked where we were going there. We'd have to pick up <laughs> Well, we've got tons <laughs> of questions, you see, so we need to get into that. Uh, 
So Artmaster Studio TV, keto carnivore for over a year now with a bit of 18.6 fasting. My weight, the same as when I started. Any thoughts, guys? I'll start. I'll do a short answer, then we'll have Rich step up, <laughs> give you the, the long version. Um, firstly, could be body composition. I've got some props. This is a representation of some fat and muscle, which would weigh the same, all right? So if you've got all this fat... Let's say that's a pound, you lose that pound of fat and you gain a pound of muscle. You have no weight loss, but your body composition might change. So that's the first thing. I know we got told off for this last week um, talking about this, but looking in the mirror, looking at your clothes, those sort of things are much better than the scale. And if, if you've got a lot of healing going on as well, your body will prioritize using the raw materials that are coming in to fix those things. And I always use this analogy of a broken house. Okay. So if I was doing up a house and for weeks on end, there was, there was not enough bricks and there was not enough mortar and there was not enough um, tiles. Okay. So I'm, I'm saying that somebody that's analogous to somebody doing a calorie restricted diet or a low fat diet. I would be constantly in this house thinking, I can't repair it because I haven't got the raw materials. Now, if all of a sudden someone dumped a load of bricks in there and a load of uh, tiles and a load of mortar, which could be your fat, protein, carbohydrates, and said, do you want even more? I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, because I, I never know when that famine's going to happen again. I never know when I'm going to be short of storage. So, yeah, drop in as much as you can, and I'm going to start fixing stuff up. I wouldn't be then looking at the stores going, actually, I want to get rid of some of these fat stores, you know, or th th these mortar stores. Let's use mortar as saying that is the fat. I I'm going to keep that because you know, I've had, you know, 15 years of trying to do up houses and I've never had this beautiful amount of raw material. And I think this is one thing that happens to a lot of people. They say, I haven't lost much weight, but my hair's slightly better. Uh, my mood's better. My skin looks better. I've got more energy. You know, and, and then the scale becomes a little bit irrelevant because you have to say, well, your body's healing first. So anyway, go on, Rich, fire away. No, I think that's fantastic. It, this, you've hit the nail on the head. It is, but body composition is, is a major factor, isn't it? it um, you know, my my weight when I was in a bulking phase, uh, in sort of in prep for competition, if you like, was almost the same as it was when I was clinically obese. Um, yet my body fat percentage went from 60-something, I think mid-60s, down to 2% when I competed. Um it's a big difference in body composition, but the weight was the same. So what I'd question there is, um, you know, how are you feeling? Are your aches and pains gone away? Do you feel better for it? Is your mental clarity better? Are you feeling healthier and fitter? Because those are the things that are important. The weight loss is simply a side effect uh, of uh, being unhealthy. It's a side effect of inflammation and insulin resistance. And if you've healed those, it doesn't matter really what your weight is, and unless you, know, you are severely overweight. And then there are levers that we can pull. Um, you know, I would, in that case, maybe look at what you are eating in regards to, to carnivore. Um, if, if you're eating, uh, cheese or, and, and cream, for example, um, you know, that could be possibly too much. Uh, are you, um, maybe overdoing the salt and retaining more water, uh, which is incredibly difficult. And most of the, most of our body weight is water. So we're going to retain a lot of water, um, especially as we adopt a ketogenic and carnivore style lifestyle, um, but those are the things that I would address is, you know, how are you feeling? Because um, th those are the reasons that you begin the lifestyle. Those are the things that are important. The weight is just a side effect, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a great answer. Yeah. So um, it's trial and error in the end. It's trial and error. This is when people say, can I have, a, you know, uh, how much protein do I need? How much fat do I need? Well, we don't know your activity levels, how well you sleep, what the temperature is, where you are, uh, your previous history. So you can't tell somebody you need to eat X amount of stuff. The easiest thing to do is to um, eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full, drink when you're thirsty, and then take it from there. Take it very basically. And look at how a couple of weeks have gone. And, yeah, there are some culprits that do spring up and cause problems. Uh, definitely you can eat too much fat. Definitely you can have too much dairy. You have to see what your body copes with. Um, some people find they can't cope with the fat for six months a year, you know, or they have to take lipase or something. Well, 
you know, you just got, it's all trial and error, really. Something really interesting that um, I'll check in on that is that um, I've come from a bodybuilding background where I was incredibly lean, but didn't do very much cardio. I would train typically for 45 minutes to an hour, um, but I was always lean, always shredded. Um, now I've gravitated into more cardio based stuff. Now, you know, the last two or three weeks, you know, I haven't been doing as much as I should. Um, but over the course of this year, I've done way more cardio and way more hours in regards to, to, to cardio training comparative to weight training. Um, as you know, last week I did something like a 112 mile bike ride and it was a hundred miler before that. And you're talking seven hours in the saddle. I didn't train seven hours in a day when I was weight training. Um, so the hour, you know, the hours, the time that I've spent training was was considerably is considerably higher now relative to what I used to do. My fat has gone up. My fat has increased. And I put this down to a comment that somebody put in a few weeks ago when they said, you know, well, you know, isn't all of that training bad for you, counterintuitive? Do you remember that conversation we had? And it is yes. because of the It LMA. is, absolutely. Yeah, I'm with it. Yeah. yeah. You're training your body to slow your metabolism down. Yeah. Plus, it's this elevation in cortisol, which is occurs beyond an hour typically, that's yep. leading to weight gain. So I, I, I do these rides, 112 miles, sitting in a saddle for six or seven hours, not eating anything because I don't need it. Um, coming off the ride and being heavier than when I started. Obviously, I'm drinking water, so there's a lot of water weight. But the next day when my body you know, would catch up, I'd still be heavier from doing this and not eating an awful lot. Um, so hormones, I've got a lot to do with in regards. In fact, you know, our weight gain is is controlled by the endocrine system. Those are hormones that govern whether we gain or lose weight. So, uh, you know, if there are external factors going on in regards to stress, this can lead to weight gain. Uh, if you're overtraining, it can lead to weight gain. So there's lots lots of things there that you can look at in regards to why maybe you're not losing weight, but. Uh, a few things there, I think there are uh, food for thought, pun intended. Yes. So, yeah, Mike saying hello to Jonathan or uh, Johnny. That's a composition consultant. Hope you're still watching. Lindsay's saying hello from South Africa. I'm going to zip through some comments, Rich, because we're way behind. Uh, so, yeah. Ayana's saying she runs for mental strength and it's fun and different from weightlifting, not losing muscle, but I'll check. Absolutely. I mean, that's always the kicker. Um, when people talk to me about running, yeah, if, if running is your sort of place to download and de-stress and that's how you function, I absolutely 100% get that. So there you go. Uh, that's a great comment. So, uh, Mike, you mentioned not to combine weightlifting and cardio, but what about weightlifting followed by high-intensity sprints? Is that also anti-anabolic? I mean, I would I would say no because that's short, explosive movements. So what do yeah. you say, Rich? Yeah, I agree. Providing you within that window, because um, typically once we've gone beyond an hour, we are increasing cortisol, which could be counterintuitive. Mm. Um, so I mean, it's up to uh, we're all different. It's up to up to you to gauge. But I, I wouldn't class that. That's high intensity. So I mean, th that's the type of training that, that I'd I'd want to be doing rather than running for for for, for you know four hours, for example. Um, yeah. I forget you've yeah. got a different uh, audience to me because all all the people I think that follow me know I'm notoriously into very short workouts. So my you know my strength training workouts will never exceed 15 minutes. And if I was to go out and do sprint intervals, which is what I call them, sprint intervals, sprinting for intervals, I might do four to ten intervals, uh, and that's it. And it's 100 meters. I'm just run and that's it. Uh, actually, I've reintroduced that after eight months of not doing it. And my first go was uh, last week, going back to sprinting, which which was all true. And I said, you've inspired me to get back into doing a bit of that sort of work. And uh, within a week, well, actually, let's put it, <laughs> put it the other way around. When I started, my performance was atrocious, absolutely atrocious. And within one week, I've got it to be twice as fast as I was. That's how bad I had got from not doing it. All right. So anyway, uh, right. We've got another another nice question here from Carl uh, or statement. My N equals one from being keto carnivore for one year. I find my performance isn't what it used to be when eating carbs. My muscles are burning out quick and I find my runs a bit harder. 
suggestions. That's a great um, comment and question. Yeah, this, you know, context is really important because t- typically when you've been keto carnivore for three to six months, you'll adapt and your body will upregulate certain enzymes and pathways, particularly things like the monocarboxylate transporters, um, which will allow us to recycle lactate in the muscle uh, and allow us to train harder and for longer. Um, it's unusual after a year for your performance to be dipping. Um, what I, what I, the only difference in regards to what you, carbs don't build muscle and carbs don't make you strong. Um, they don't build muscle at all. So if we consume adequate protein, we will build equal amounts of muscle as to when we are co-consuming carbohydrates. But what does build muscle, what does increase muscle protein synthesis is the co-ingestion of protein with fat as nature intended. Um, that builds more muscle. But the only difference that you may be lacking with carbohydrate is for every one gram of carbs in the muscle, we're going to hold three to four grams of glyco. Uh, and that's leverage in the muscle. And this is, so going off piste a little bit, uh, Dianabol, uh, a popular steroid on the, on the market, um, will increase size massively and make you absolutely huge and incredibly strong. Uh, but when athletes come off Dianabol, they lose all their size and all their strength back to being um, you know, where they were previously with very little gain, if none at all. Uh, and the reason for this is that it's adding volume to the muscle. So it's, it's adding volume, which is allowing you to give leverage. It's giving you leverage. So it's making you stronger in that respect. Um, creatine. Creatine will make you stronger. So are you taking creatine? Creatine will hold water in the muscle. It'll supply uh, energy to the PC system. So for these explosive movements, it's not carbohydrate that supplies energy to the PC system. It's creatine. It's the phosphocreatine energy system. So this is anywhere between nine seconds up to like 30 odd, I think by memory. Um, but those are the one lifters or the five reps. Um, you know, all of your strength stuff, you're sprinting, that comes from the PC system. It doesn't come from the glycolytic energy system. That comes later on. But the gly- glycolytic energy system uh, or the lac- lactate system uh, we, being keto and carnivore, have, have the ability to upregulate. As I say, once we upregulate the monocarboxid transporters, we have the ability to send lactate from the muscle to the liver, uh, and the liver will recycle it into glycogen, and you heard that correctly, glycogen, back to the muscle at a higher rate than a carb athlete. So even being ketogenic and carnivore, we still have the ability to create glycogen in the muscle. And this is where the confusion with carbs in athletic sports came into um, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s um, was because scientists, I think it was the 70s, wasn't it? That scientists uh, discovered that we needed glycogen in the muscle for for, for energy. We needed glycogen. Um, we knew carbohydrates broke down into glycogen. So we just assumed that we needed carbohydrates. Um, but we never investigated to see if the body had another mechanism in order to upregulate the body's ability to create glycogen. And it does. Keto adaptation, being keto carnivore for three to six months, allows the body to upregulate, upregulate those pathways and enzymes and recycle this lactate. Um, so I'd salt is also important. That's going to add that volume that I mentioned earlier. So what, what I'd suggest maybe experimenting with is, you know, more water, more salt, you know, sodium, um, that's going to give you a better pump, uh, and creatine. So, you know, maybe you could come back and, but there, Kyle and see if, you know, if you are taking any of those, but, um, they'll make a massive difference if you're not for sure. I'm maybe not now because I'm not lifting, but when I was training up until last year, I was the strongest that I'd ever been on zero carbohydrate. Um, you know, to put it, I, I'm not, um, strong compared to some of these, some of these guys who were lifting stupid weights, but I'm small. Uh, you know, my, my weight at the time was like 75 K and I would bench press 165 K. Um, I would deadlift 230 and, and squat 190, um, which pound for pound put me in the top 10 in the UK in, in powerlifting. And I never competed. Um, I think in fact, in, in, um, natural, in the natural competitions, it would have put me number three, which is what I was going to go into. I was going to go into powerlifting in order to prove our lifestyle. But after tearing, uh, tearing my pec, um, that's what pulled me into the running and cycling. It was only meant to be um, a little piece to keep me occupied for a few weeks while I healed. And then, yeah, I, n- <laughs> I never went back. But and then you got addicted to the competitive then, nature, yeah, which is great. Yeah. Uh, can I just add on the, the, the reason we talk about fat? In many reasons, Rich just just talked about, but 
very often not mentioned is the reason we say protein and fat. Fat will make the release of bile happen and the absorption of amino acids and protein, muscle protein synthesis needs that step. Bile actually will help with amino acid absorption. So um, when you do low carb, sorry, lo uh, low or lean cuts and you take the fat out, that can sometimes be problematic unless we go to the next question, which is from Tom, uh, who says, would you say 310 grams of protein and 200 grams of fat is low enough in fat for a day when you focus on two, three day of lean meats for a cut like we talked about from Tom? So I'm assuming. Yeah, Tom know, and I had, yeah, we yeah. did a consultation, a fantastic guy. Um, yeah, Tom is, is, is a big guy. Um, but yeah, Tom, I think you were six foot something incredibly tall from what I can remember. Ch chuck it into the comments uh, and incredibly heavy, wasn't it? I can't remember the exact weight. Um, but from the conversation we had, Tom, base everything around protein, aim for at least one gram per pound of body weight. Um, fat, I mean, looking at that from what I can remember seems okay, but fat, eat fat from nature. Um, yeah. Grams of protein. To yeah, let's just qual can qualify what you just said. It's one one gram of protein for uh, lean body mass, not your body so not, weight. Yeah, well, but that's the thing. Nobody knows their lean body mass. So it, what the true figure is 0.82. No point eight two, no point eight two grams per pound of lean mass. Um, but we know that excess protein causes very little. It doesn't cause much. We need protein. I don't think yes. protein is something we can overconsume. So for easeability, I always you know, I, I recommend people do one gram per pound and you're, you're going to be in a surplus yes. and that's fine. But it's, I think, I uh, think Rich, sorry, just, just, just to broaden it out, you see, you're talking about the bodybuilding, but if we've got people listening or watching who are 300 pounds and they want to be 200. Yeah. But I, I, again, it's, look, protein is something that you can't, um, you can't over consume on. So uh, Phil Taylor, for example, um, as you guys know that I've been working with Phil a little bit, I put him, I, I trebled the food that he was eating a few weeks ago. And before I did that, he said, I'm, there's no way I can eat it. I'm only eating once <laughs> a day now. I said, Phil, you know, just, just try it. Um, and he did. He trebled the food. And the next few days, he was down a few pounds. The yes. body <laughs> is a strange machine. It, it, what happens when we eat protein? Protein carries a high thermic effect. Um, and to a degree, the more protein we consume, the, the, the higher that thermic effect is. Um, the protein heals and repairs the body. When we heal and repair the body, we reduce inflammation. Inflammation causes us to hold weight. So through lots of different mechanisms, eating protein is the key. We should never, never um, not eat enough protein. Don't avoid eating protein. The fat is the lever that's going to govern whether we can gain or lose weight. Um, and, you know, I would drop fat a lot when I was cutting for competition. <clears throat> the amount we need to drop is different for everyone. You need to do it mm -hmm. as a gauge. Uh, I mean, 200 grams of fat there. I mean, that, me looking at that now, not remembering, you know, your body weight seems high. Um, 200 grams of fat. Is it low enough for the lean days? I think that's what you're going on, isn't it? Um, I don't, that seems a little bit high to me, Tom. Um, I'd have to go back and, and revisit the conversation that we had. But we're all different. We're all going to have different outcomes. It's yep. easy to gauge when we are ketogenic and carnivore because I, I eat the same food. So what I would do is if you're not cutting for a competition, we can do this sustainably, um, you know, over time. So you need to reduce your fat for those those days that we spoke about uh, and go back to the higher fats on, on the higher fat days. Uh, if after a week nothing has moved, then the week after we reduce fat a little bit further. And it is as simple as that. You know, we can apply a formula. Um but the formulas are different for everybody and we would need to be, you know, working together for a few weeks before we could gauge where you are metabolically. Uh, we may need to test the metabolism in order to ramp it up um, or not, but everybody is different and we all move differently. You can't say that X amount of, you know, the conversation that we had with Bart K recently, a calorie, calories, they don't really exist. Uh, I want to go into the science bin, you know, but, you know, Stephen and I, don't track calories. You know, if, if anything, I track macros, but I, I don't even track macros anymore. I eat intuitively um, and I gauge things intuitively. But if um, 
you know, you were to look at two different people who did the exact same exercise on, on the same days, twins. Let's look at a set of twins. Um, they might have a different uh, a different outcome on their NGO, but because one of them may tap their foot, they may tap, they may play with a pen when they're talking, they may tap their foot while they're sitting in the chair, they may bounce back and forth while the other may sit. All of these things have a massive impact on the amount of energy that your body is using. So you can't apply a formula that's going to be 100% accurate to everyone. Yeah. This is why it's got to be gauged over time. Uh, everybody is an individual. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, and th th the thing is, if people think uh, I'm trying to trip Rich up, I'm just playing devil's advocate because people will be watching saying, well, is that if you if it – is it the weight you want to be or the weight you are? How do you work it out? And the, the thing is, I, I am also on the same page with Rich when it comes to protein. It's really difficult to overeat. It's really difficult to overeat fat <laughs> you, and protein. You try gaining weight eating nothing but protein. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, yeah, but I, I, when people need a guide, that's, that's the rule of thumb. Uh, you know, and I agree that you can be more nuanced. Uh, Thief Bear. Now, I'm going to say I'm not the world's greatest person at reading these <laughs> names, and I hope I've said that right. But since December 2022, they've reduced their waste by 11.8%. So it's gone from 42 to 37. Weight from 245 pounds to 205. Brilliant. And using the US Navy algorithm, six feet tall, around 26, sorry, around 27% body fat is now 20. Uh, so there you go. Um, Eating steak. That's Perfect. great. You see, but I, I would tell you that, that your diet, what your exercise is, is worked for you, but it might not work for someone else. And th this is always saying for everybody, there's, uh, you know, a, a trial and error period, I think. Um, so there's some to and fro comments in in the in the stream there, which I won't put on the screen because it's just people talking to each other now. So yeah, that's good. Um, there is an interesting thing here. Uh, Vital, I just vegans never produce any uh, provide any evidence. They are just making videos, and I I've got to be honest, that is true in the main. Most people seem to not have references when they're talking about. Um, uh, nutrition science they don't have the science and they quote or just spout the same nonsense that there is no proof for so uh, i mean using that guy earlier that sean was very upset about you know he's not looked he calls himself the acid reflex guy uh, or reflux guy and um thinks carnivore doesn't resolve it where well, it clearly does so i've got a hundred people and he's got a thousand people so you know it clearly does work on that, so that's that's um, not very factual. So Benny C, question: What is the effect of a carnivore? Or oh, sorry, uh, it's been a long day. What is the effect of a keto diet on creatinine levels, and what would be considered a normal creatinine level on a keto diet? You probably uh, may have a better answer than this for me. Creatinine is something I haven't looked at since I was bodybuilding over a year ago. I used to track my bloods regularly. Um, mine was always elevated because I trained a lot, um, which will increase levels and I supplemented with creatine, which will increase levels. Um, so I always worked on, yeah, I can't even remember the ranges, Steve. I don't know if, if you can, um, but mine were constantly elevated because I was, I was working out. So, I mean, the levels are going to depend on, on your activity and what, what you are doing as well, but where the yeah, well, let's, let, me, let me let me give you it so yeah 0 0.6 to 1.2 uh, milligrams per deciliter would be the sort of range but i'm telling you now the normative ranges on bloods are not optimal all yeah. right uh so before we did bloods okay nobody knew anything right? and this is a little history lesson from when i did my phlebotomy so what did they do they just took loads of bloods and they took loads of readings and eventually when they had enough uh bloods they came up with these ranges of oh, well it seems like we've done, we've done 100 blood tests let's be really basic about this little story and if you look at all the different things this seems to be the average all right so that's probably all right uh, there was very little sort of nuance to it other than that and then and there was no looking at what they were eating so one of the things that comes up constantly for me, because I've got the phlebotomy, is people sending me blood and saying my blood urea nitrogen's gone up, and so has my creatinine. Creatinine. So, um, the, a breakdown product of protein synthesis is creatinine, and if you go slightly higher in your protein, that level will go up, and so will your blood urea nitrogen. Now, then they will say 
my doctor is having a bit of a problem. Now, I have just literally done a video of someone that was stage three on the kidney disease and has reversed it categorically. I think their GFR, which is the glomerulus filtration rate, which has a little E, by the way, which is estimated, and that's an important point, went from 48 to 84 on a, on a carnivore diet, not even keto, on carnivore, so just basically pure protein, and actually went from being a potential dialysis candidate to healthy. All right, and, and now doing incredible training and everything. Now, um, so that what is the effect on, on your levels? Well, they'll go up because you're probably going to eat more protein. Second thing is you're going to get people telling you if you have any bloods that things don't look right because they will be comparing it to a, these normative ranges for people that don't eat much protein but also eat a lot of carbohydrates. So... Um, if you're worried for any reason, which I'm, you've not mentioned here, for instance, if you do have bloods and it says your EGFR is a little low, uh, I would actually say, well, I need a cystatin C test, which is more of a direct reading of your blood urea nitrogen and your kidney function than an estimated GFR. Because the estimated GFR is based on calculations, based on normal people, normal as in not eating high protein. That's in um, people. <laughs> yeah, thick people. Basically, you've took the words right out of my mouth. So, so that's my answer there. Um, uh, let's have a look. So, uh, there's a lot of tuna throwing, like I say, in the in the comments. Hopefully, that's helped, Benny. Right. So, so the normative ranges I gave you. Don't worry too much if you're out of those. Look at other things uh, around it as well. Your GFO and all that. Right. So, Carla said I used to be on Lancer. Prolis and drink bottles and bottles of Gaviscon because of acid reflux. All medication has stopped since keto carnivore, so that's good. Yeah, Shout out to Carl. Question. I know Carl. Good. Yeah. Uh, right. Let's have a look. I think we're meet, we meeting up soon. Um, actually, Carl, I think are we. Sorry. I think Carl's popping over to see me soon. I can't remember oh, when, cool. but yeah. I do love this name, Reality Chick. <laughs> Hello, I've been carnivore since June 5th and reduced my thyroid meds this week because I'm healing. There you go. Brilliant. This is great. Uh, Matthew's asked another question. Does taking antidepressant medications such as, oh, blimey, Estelopram uh, deplete vitamins and minerals? Does it? I don't know that. I, not off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know for sure, but most medications seem to have a negative impact on the, on the body's ability to absorb. So, uh, but we can't yeah. give specific advice, especially when yeah. it comes to medication, unfortunately, but, um, yeah, in my experience, anyway. medications do, uh, do have a negative impact, but yes. Well, that, I mean, the, the mechanism of action of most, most medications is to interact with an enzyme and either improve, increase the action of the enzyme or decrease it. So it's going to have an effect a knock-on effect all around your body. Alan has asked, if I take exogenous ketones, exogenous ketones, which, you know, are like this sort of thing here, look, Keto Pro, I don't know if that's not in focus. Anyway, um, should I take them every day? I marathon train five days a week and I lift three days a week. Should you take exogenous ketones? As You've got powder own. there, haven't you? Yeah, so that, that oil is C8, it's caprylic acid. So what happens to that is it's sent straight to the liver through the hepatic portal vein and it's instantly created into ketones, whether you are ketogenic or not. That, that's the power of C8. Um, now, that will supply ketones to the brain, the body, and the heart. Um, I use them every day. Uh, I use them for different purposes. Um, I use it more for mental clarity because it floods my brain with, with ketones. I work stupid amounts of hours. Now, the argument would be that being ketogenic and carnivore, we're creating these ketones naturally, which we do, um, and that to use the ketones would be wasted. But it depends on um, how um, how active, I guess, your, your brain and your body are. I mean, I work 18-hour days. I work seven days a week. So um, I'm only human. I haven't had a day off since I can remember. On, day, on the days that I technically have off, I'm riding 112 miles on a bike. So <laughs> if you can count as a day off... Um, so the ketones will do a number of things. <clears throat> they reduce inflammation, so they help my body heal and repair a lot quicker, um, which obviously living keto and carnival will do naturally to a degree. But they flood my brain with these ketones that supply, they breach the blood-brain barrier, they supply my body and my brain with this energy at a much 
heightened level. So typically what you see is if you are keto carnivore and your your level of, of activity is there, your your performance. And if you take ketones, the ketones will increase, say, say that much. However, what percentage that is, that could be different for everyone. If you were a carb athlete and you were to take ketones, but your baseline's a lot lower. So if you're ketogenic and you're naturally, you know, you're adapted, you're going to be better than yourself on carbohydrate. If you were to take ketones, then this would elevate your ability almost to where you were on ketones. So the percentage improvement is going to be a lot higher if you were a carb athlete, but obviously we are much more uh, efficient at producing energy. So we're higher anyway, but that percentage is smaller. Um, so should you take them every day? Um, I do. I take them for anti-inflammatory purposes. I take it. I only use one scoop per day um, from, from the tub. Uh, which would be a third of, of the raspberry bomb, if 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 that's what you're comparing it to. But the raspberry bomb does contain caffeine. The other ketones that, that I do in the, the, the form of the BHP in the tub do not. Um, and I also take it after training, uh, especially cardio workouts, because it increases. Um, oh, my goodness. What's um, what was Lance Armstrong done for for taking? I don't know. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's gone. It'll come back. Uh, How much something you take if it's the oil. Just so the, the oil, look, you can take you can take as much or as little as you want. Um, a no, cap full. Yeah, a, a tablespoon. But if you were beginning, I would advise to start with a teaspoon because the oil can cause gastro distress. So I also do a powder. The powder version um, doesn't cause uh, the gastro distress, and you can take a lot more. And then, you, you know, if you if you are a coffee drinker on carnivore, that acts as a creamer as well. Um, but I, I know some people who take one serving per day and some that take lots and lots. Um, now, the, the beauty with this is that the caloric value is almost negligible because of the way that it's processed. So you'll get all the benefit of the increased um, you know, benefits of the ketones. Uh, but that will increase ketone levels to, say, 0.5 minimolars, whereas taking exogenous ketones can increase it by one and a half to maybe two. Um, so it, it depends on what you're looking to do. But the interesting thing is they work through different different mechanisms. So the ketones work directly, whereas the, the C8 has got to be converted into ketones. Um, uh, studies have shown that they work synergistically. So when I take the ketones, I add the MCT powder because what ketones do initially is they shut off fat burning because your body doesn't need to produce ketones because you're flooding your body with ketones. So And this is why they get a lot of bad press. They shut off your body uh, creating ketones. Um, C8 powder and oil does not do that. It, it increases ketones immediately, whether you're ketogenic or not. It'll, in, it'll have an impact on, on fat metabolism. It'll increase the body's ability to burn uh, a little bit more fat. And I'm not talking losing stones. This isn't a fat, um, uh, you know, medica fat loss medication. This isn't a fat burning pill, nothing like that. Um, but it does help mobilize fat and increase uh, lipolysis and the body's ability to, to utilize and create ketones. Um, but the thing is that when you use them together, they work synergistically. So in, instead of the ketones shutting off the body's ability to create ketones, it actually ramps it up. They work synergistically. Now, that said, you don't want to use it as a weight loss pill because, as I say, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, and this is why you don't want to use it too much. So you could over consume on on the the, the BHB, if it's just, you know, some clients of mine have used it all day, every day. Well, now your body isn't burning any fat at all because it doesn't need to. Your body's flooded with these exogenous ketones. It no longer needs to produce endogenous ketones. So use sparingly for weight loss. Uh, use after a workout to help with recovery. Um, blocks inflammation. Um, and, you know, you can use before a workout uh, so I would use, for example, on a long bike ride because it helps with inflammation in my legs. And if you were to take the ketones before marathon, the ketones would would last for the entire marathon. In fact, um, one serving of the C8 oil or powder would um, would probably supply your body with ketones for an hour, which is you know one third of the, of, the, of your marathon or a quarter of your marathon, depending on how fast you're running. Um, so they're absolutely incredible. But there is no. Definitive answer again. Context is important. You know, if you want to reach out to me directly, and um, we can work out what you're, you're what you're trying to get out of the ketones, because what you're trying to do is is uh, is incredibly important in regards to how and when you're going to take that product. But it's something I use every day. I cre I created these products for me to use, um, and I I use them every day because I see a benefit personally.
Brilliant. See, now, uh, just for people, we've, we've gone to the hour. Uh, and if you're interested, Rich and I have a, a Mighty Networks, which I've just put a link into the comments, where you could you could go on. It's free to get up, just log on, have a look at that, and you can start to in and fro in with people because um, the idea is to bounce off each other. Um, it was nice to see, for instance, Dr. Kiltz just pop in and say hello. Which was Yeah, hey, Dr. Kiltz. I was in mid-flow. Apologies, I didn't get a chance to yeah. say hello. But, uh... um, and we're way behind on all the questions, but we try to give you thorough answers, you see. Now, if you are putting this question on the live and you, you think, oh, I'd, I'd like to ask more, and sadly they only do this for an hour because we can't do a 24-hour one every week. Um and you can go onto that community, tell people what you're eating, give each other a little bit of um, sort of uh, motivation, a little bit of accountability, just pictures of what you're eating, whatever. And then pop a question on there and you can get these sort of answers from people in the carnivore community. I'll be on there. You know, Rich will be on there. Sorry, Rich. That's all right. I've just, just seen the thing pop up there about uh, from Bernie C about last time. So it was EPO. EPO was the compound or one of the compounds. He was also done for blood doping and all sorts of things. But EPO, we create naturally and taking the BHB after workout will naturally increase EPO. Apologies. So we're going to rattle through a few. Uh, what happens if you overconsume electrolytes? My understanding is you have this system of urination and detoxing that tends to work because um, that's what your body does. It does tend to regulate your uh, electrolytes. You'll be incredibly, yeah, you incredibly hard pushed to overconsume electrolytes, especially especially if they're the quality electrolytes are the right ratio. Um, one of the studies in the presentations I give shows uh, s sodium excretion, the amount of sodium that is excreted through the body. Um, so we can only assume that what is excreted is what at least what is consumed, because some of it is obviously uh, utilized. Um, we are told not to consume more than one and a half thousand milligrams per day, um, but this on the study that I reference, it covers 17 countries, over 100,000 participants. And it shows that if we go below 2,000 milligrams per day, that we increase our risk of death massively. All cause mortality goes through the roof, with the sweet spot being around four to 6,000 milligrams. Uh, and I consume closer to 10,000 milligrams of sodium per day. I have never gotten to the point where I've taken in too much salt. Um, but the salt to water ratio is important. You can't just be eating salt. You need to be hydrating as well. They, they both work synergistically. So you need the water to be hydrated, but you need the salts in order to do that. Otherwise, you, you just, if you, for example, consuming too much water, you're doing nothing more than simply flushing out those electrolytes. So there is a balance. There is a synergy between the two. But I, I've never known anyone to, to overdose from consuming too much salts. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things I want to say is, I've been trying to do my own animations because the animations for things that happen in the body are still very much based on carbohydrates. And they always upset me because they always seem to miss a critical point or it's uh, the, the ratios are wrong or something. And um, I actually experimented with doing some th showing actually action potentials, which was showing, uh, you know, sodium and potassium outside and inside the cell. And I wanted to do it correctly. So I attached molecules of water to, to each one. And it made the illustration so difficult to look at. Um, I, I ended up not doing it. But, that, that, but I think that's part of the problem. People seem to think that the electrolytes float around or glucose floats around. as like a little ball with a G on if it's glucose and it's going through your blood like that. And it just isn't what happens. They attach to water molecules and, um, you know, what rich is saying and it goes on to the next next question what's your opinion on silk or celtic salt i mean i love celtic salt and i'm really switched on to it yeah but in the dispenser it's it's damp you know it is damp it's not like these salts that are uh dry and easy to 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 grind out um because salt has an affinity with water or vice versa so i think when you're hydrating it's very important to not quaff down a whole liter of water you do need to have salt in there if you're looking to hydrate properly uh here we go we have the best live apparently which is good uh that's very nice of you to say it's one of the best chats because we can communicate effectively with coaches and each other you see so this is good that's what we're trying to do um right 
Let's have a look. It's, 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 a love, it's a love fest at the moment. It's really nice. Uh, thanks, guys. Much sense spoken. I lost 10 stone six years oh. ago on keto. In eight months, kept that weight off. Not the same this time. I'm 58 years old, uh, six foot and 21 stone. Yeah, well, you know, th- one of the things is um, it is a lifestyle change. That's the important thing. It isn't a diet as such. And um, you need to get to the food freedom point of view where you're not constantly thinking about food or restricting yourself or saying, I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to eat cheesecake. I'm not, you know, so I think one of the things I was trying to say about the Mighty Network, for instance, is we will be talking in that community about, you know, overcoming cravings and addictions. And there will be some paid for content as well where, you know, you can get 30 days, you know, a daily thing to follow if you're interested. That's the sort of thing we're doing. But first thing is to just log in and and say hello and get to know everybody. Weight gain is heavily influenced by the hormone lipase. I think weight gain, yes, that's a good comment. I think it's very hormonal driven, but there are emotional elements to it as well. I'd say, I think, um, my big thing, I say my story, sorry, Rich, I'm, I'm doing a, you doing a long answer here, but I'm getting through these things here is when I first went to low carb, the biggest problem I had was going to the cinema because the cinema, my head was totally geared to a big Coke and a hot dog. That was it. And even though I'd given up bread and felt better and lost a ton of weight and uh, that was a big surprise to me. There was nothing to do with hunger, nothing to do with hormones. That really was uh, association of that situation. So that was how I was thinking about it as well. TLV has said, I've piled on a load of weight. I've piled on a load of weight since going carnivore. And it's all muscle mass. And I'm loving it. Finally quit my chocolate addiction this week and looking forward to winter swell. I feel so strong. So that's good. Uh, Tom is, you wanted to know how tall Tom is. He's six foot eight and 107 kilograms. Yeah. I'll work that out and drop Tom a message okay. after. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's whistle through this. Uh, I love people. I love giving people the goal of eat one gram of protein per standard goal body weight. So at five foot five, that's 125 pounds. So I eat 125 grams at least, but often more. You see, this is the thing. Uh, your body wants protein, especially, especially if you're training. Uh, right. And we've caught up to where Dr. Kiltz came in, which was, I think, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so, I wonder if we should get um, Dr. Kiltz on if he's up for, for maybe next week or something. Um, well, if so you, if, yeah, if, if, if you're still, if, if you're still uh, listening, Dr. Kiltz, yeah. I don't know if, if, if what do you think, Steve? Be good to get. Well, he's um, always great. I mean, I love yeah. Rob. I think he's he's just To be honest, it's very difficult to say this because it feels like favoritism. And actually, I think every every kind of war influencer (laughs) is brilliant. I really do. I genuinely do. When we did that 24, there wasn't one person I was thinking, they didn't really show up. They didn't bring their A game, you know. But yes, Rob is is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. And he's just. I don't want people to think it's just flannel. It's genuine. These people are really great. Behind the scenes are really great as well. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I just seen um, Dr. Kiltz has just come back now and said he'd love to. So there we are. Tune in for, for next week. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, yeah. Dr. Kiltz. Special guest. Yes. Brilliant. Kiltz's cups, Kiltz's ice cream. We'll be talking about all of that. That's great. I think it's great that he's a fertility expert. and but But everyone wants to talk about everything. You know, and this is the other thing. You get so interested in every other area. You can be a specialist in one area. You know, I think, you know, for me, when I started this, and especially because the personal training, I was training an Olympic athlete with diabetes. That's my qualification, really getting into the sort of diabetic side. I thought, yeah, this is going to be my, my niche. But um, you just get into absolutely everything. Uh, another success story. Uh, been carnivore since April 2023. Dropped 14 Dropped from 14 stone 7 to 11 stone 13. Uh, in the UK, we use stone, which is uh, each stone is 14 pounds. So, uh, yeah, so 14 stone 7 pounds to 11 stone 13. Waist drop from 38 to 34. 58 years old, 5 foot 9 and doing 65 push-ups in one set. That is awesome. That's yeah, awesome. That's incredible. 
I think Dr. Kitts has said what time. We're live at seven now. We were live at five UK time, um, but now it's seven next week. Um, yeah, let, well, let's give Dr. Kilt some we'll, realistic, because in the UK now, I don't know what your time is, Rob, it's but quarter now, it's, now it's, it's, quarter, it's quarter past eight in the evening, 8.15 p.m. So, And we started an hour and 15 ago. So whatever your time is now, just take an hour off, and that's, and that's when it will be. Uh, right. Um, Benny's talking about his creatinine levels. My doctor exam had a low range of 0.7 and a higher range of uh, 1.3. Yeah, and that's the other thing. We talked about this last week. Some labs will have different ranges as well. Um, but I, I would I would want you to look at the whole thing, so like your GFR and your blood urea, nitrogen, and everything. Right, let's have a look. Next one. Uh, my son came home from uni and couldn't handle the fact his dad is metabolically fitter than him. <laughs> He's turned carnivore this week. And that's that's it. Be the example. That is it. Be the example, which is which is great. Uh, Inns is a uh, question. Hi, I'm two months carnivore. My priority is to lose weight. I'm over 300 pounds. First month, I lost 20 pounds. But now I'm gaining again. I eat OMAD and so confused. Should I add fat to meals? Afraid to do so. Eat intuitively. Uh, again, so it, initially the weight loss is going to come through a lot of fluid loss. Yes, there's fat loss involved as well. But you're coming from a state of high insulin resistance. So typically what happens is we're, re we're reversing that insulin, insulin resistance. Almost overnight we begin to reverse it. We can quite literally see on the graph of insulin. Uh, resistance that uh, we can we can re reverse and repair this incredibly quickly. But when insulin drops, it signals the kidneys to release sodium from the body, uh, and along with it, uh, lots of water. So a lot of the, the the weight that we lose initially is is water um, and glycogen, as our glycogen stores are released. Um, so it's common for things to slow down. Um, but coming back to a point we made earlier, it's incredibly difficult to to gain weight when you're eating nothing but but protein. Um, uh, maybe a question we can we can answer maybe next next week if you wanted to pop in the comments below. But I'd like to know what you are eating. Um, there are certain things that we can consume, or you know, we 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 consume being keto or carnivore that can cause us to to hold uh, weight. Uh, and OMAD isn't always the best thing either, um, because it, we can we may increase cortisol through not consuming enough throughout the day. Um, I typically eat maybe twice a day, sometimes once a day, sometimes I eat three times a day. So I eat intuitively. I eat when I'm hungry. Uh, coffee can increase cortisol as well. And anytime we increase cortisol, this can lead uh, to weight gain uh, and other stresses. So there's lots of factors going on that, with this, but I would suggest obviously can take, uh, continuing along your journey, consuming uh, the meats, any extra fat you put in, is going to slow the process down uh, because the body is either going to use dietary fat or body fat. And we can seamlessly flick that switch from dietary fat into body fat by reducing the amount of dietary fat we consume. But it, you're so early on in your journey. For now, I would continue as you are and see how you are over the next week or two because one thing that we don't want to be doing is not consuming enough fat because fat is essential for life. It's, a, it's essential for the f formation of every cell in the body. Protein and fat is essential for everything that the body makes. Every cell in the body is made from protein and fat. Cholesterol is essential for life. It's essential for cell formation, cell formation, uh, cell, cell communication, nutrient absorption, uh, nutrient transportation, the production of hormones, and it's essential for healing. Um, so we need fat with, within our diet. So I would be, um, you know, I would be uh, cautious in regards to reducing the fat currently. Uh, and what I would suggest is eat uh, as nature intended. So an egg, for example, contains protein and fat. A piece of steak contains protein and fat. Um, chicken breast with the skin on is protein and fat. What I would come away from potentially is adding fats to your foods. If you're cooking in butter, tallow, lard, or ghee, maybe just dry cook the meats for now. Um, if you're adding cream to your coffee, maybe take out you know the, the cream. Uh, and even the coffee for now, as I say, that may be having a negative impact on cortisol. Um, Adding fats to foods, you know, adding fats to, to to cooking and everything else could have a negative impact. So take things back to basics and eat meat or food as nature intended. Eat eat it in complex without adding the fats, and see how you are within the next week or two. 
and then maybe pop on and give us an update and we can advise further from there. That's brilliant. Uh, we're coming near the end. I've got a nice question. So thanks. Every, I'm not going to flash up every every comment that's really nice, which which is great for you to do that. Thank you. Uh, but I want to get to a question that I know Rich might enjoy. So if, Mike Rudd, uh, your thoughts about Dr. Saladina's uh, use of fruit before or after exercise to temporarily boost glucose. So he's talking about our friend Saladino. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, look, let's, it was. Let's, let's just. I, I want to say this. I love Paul. I love his content, and I like his book very much. Uh, so I want to say that, but I'm not in agreement with what he does. So that's me. Yeah. So look, I've experimented. Um, as I said earlier, I'm in pursuit of optimal health um, and well-being and athletic performance. I want to be the healthiest and fittest I can be. I want to be the best athlete I can be. So I, I've experimented with carbohydrates. You know, during exercise, pre-exercise, post-exercise, I've tried with carb loading, carb back loading. I've tried with everything you could think of that has been suggested ever from every form of, of, of carbohydrate, fr you know, fruit, honey, um, uh, rice, which is lectin-free and probably one of the better ones, by the way. Um, but that's a different story. But I found no benefit. In fact, when I took in, <laughs> when I took in carbohydrate, um, it worsened my performance. <clears throat> um, I found it negatively impacted my performance. Now, the reason that, that Dr. Saladino has put um, these things back in is because he noticed a drop in, at, at least this is this is uh, what I believe to be, uh, uh, he noticed a, a drop in testosterone and decided that that was normal and decided to increase his testosterone by adding in foods that would potentially do that, i.e. carbohydrate. Um, but what we need to remember is when we look at thyroid function, for example, in, um, you know, uh, menopausal women, perimenopausal women, um, or at least perceived to be, we see a reduction in, in thyroid hormone, uh, when people begin a keto carnivore journey, um, but thyroid stimulating hormone also decreases. Now thyroid stimulating hormone is what increases thyroid hormone, but for, now, typically what happens when thyroid hormone comes down, thyroid stimulating hormone would, in, would be increased in order to try to increase thyroid hormone. But we see the opposite in keto and carnivore. We see thyroid stimulating hormone coming down. And the reason for this is the body becomes more efficient. And that makes perfect sense. Because when you think, uh, we in, in the example of insulin, when we don't eat carbohydrate, the body becomes more insulin sensitive. It doesn't become insulin resistant. We become more insulin sensitive. Uh, we need less insulin within the body to perform the same amount of work. And this is why we improve insulin resistance. The same happens with thyroid hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone. Why wouldn't it happen with testosterone? We need less testosterone to give us the same amount of work. It becomes more efficient. And that's why testosterone drops or, or perceives to be dropped. Because we're looking at parameters, like Steve said earlier, between your normal person. We're not normal people. Normal people are sick. And we are not sick. We are living our lives as nature intended. We are thriving as nature intended. This is how we have evolved our entire existence. Man is thriving through eating nothing but meat and being ketogenic and carnivore our entire existence. I don't, if, if our testosterone is lower, then it is meant to be lower. If for whatever reason our cortisol is slightly elevated, then that's where it is meant to be. This is our natural metabolic state. My, I've built packs tons and tons of muscle through being ketogenic and carnivore um, quicker arguably than anybody else I was competing against. And, um, you know, any impact that I, ha I had on testosterone definitely did not inhibit my ability to build muscle. Um, and this is why I believe Paul Saladino has put the fruit and honey back in. Um, and alongside, I think, sugar addiction. I think he's addicted to sugar. Um, but he also surfs for like three, four hours a day. Um, you know, if, if you're not training for three or four hours a day, then that's an awful lot of, of, of carbohydrate to burn off. Um, but again, we're all individual. You know, if you think it's going to work for you, fantastic experiment. But what I would suggest is we don't need an awful lot. Um, I would suggest somewhere, experiment somewhere around 0.5 grams per pound of body weight um, for, for, for an exercise to see if that has any positive impact. But myself, I've noticed no, no performance enhancing boost from carbohydrate whatsoever. Um, and the athletes that I work with, 
work towards this metabolic flexibility that they become strict keto carnivore in order to become metabolically flexible, do will fuel so they can use this glucose in, 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 in uh, performance in, in um, competition. And when they try, when they put it back in, they come away because it has a negative impact. And this is my experience. So this is what I have found. Obviously, you may find a different different outcome. You may experience uh, you know, a different output. Um, but for me, carbohydrate is not required whatsoever. Uh, and I just think it's an excuse to put something that contains sugar back in personally. Yeah. Yeah, you see, now Micah said, uh, I'll just deal with this very quickly because we can't go on for too much longer. This is the sort of, um, and I'm not knocking you, Mike, by the way, because it's worked for you. I had cramps prior to using a, a small amount of fruit. So, so once you use a, a small amount of fruit and your cramps go, you just sort of say, well, that worked. That's fine. But if you look at the mechanism, why is that working? The mechanism will be that you suddenly increased insulin and um you've increased water retention and therefore you've increased sodium retention. So that's the thing. And many people say, oh, a few, or, you know, a lot of my coach clients, I couldn't sleep until I had uh, some carbs just before bed. Well, it isn't the carbs that's helping them. It's actually that little boost of insulin. So what they could do is look at what they're eating earlier on just to have a little bit more insulin because you need insulin. It's the inappropriate, you know, uh, elevated levels of insulin that you don't want. So that small amount of fruit, you could experiment, Mike. You could actually hydrate with some salty water, like a quarter teaspoon of salt in a small tumbler of water and um not use the fruit for a bit come back next week and say yeah that actually works as well because what you're doing with the with the fruit is is without a doubt you're then getting that um insulin and water retention and sodium therefore sodium retention back up a bit but i think just cut out the fruit then you don't have the fructose which is going to your liver you just got this lovely water with a little bit of salt in and you should see that your cramps go and people fear salt this is the problem um and you don't need to as rich said earlier you know the, you can thrive with salt and we're which too scared of it so anyway right that's uh that's a 90 minute live stream i hope everyone enjoyed it thank you for the people that have hooked up into the mighty networks which is really good uh next week we're going to have dr robert kilts coming in so i'm going to have to work out how to put three people on the screen <laughs> and, Oops, uh, my bad. Rifle, <laughs> rifle questions at him do you want to uh wrap up rich yeah, I just, again, like to thank everybody for listening. Um, every week we say we're going to do 45 minutes to an hour and we're super strict no longer, but then one of us gets carried away and we end up doing an hour and a half. So <laughs> apologies. No, I, I, I think people are still here watching. I don't think that that's uh, such a big problem. And, you know, I, I didn't flash up, but, you know, um, just the, you know, there's the yin and yang every time, uh, uh, vitalitis. Uh, every time I trained, I had aching muscles including fruit, uh, stopped after a week. So, you know, there's, there's, there's different uh, ways of talking about this. Uh, anyway, right. Uh, and I'm going to finish with Ayana. Hasn't Paul finally come out saying he's not carnivore? I don't, yeah, he's called the carnivore MD. And I, I think he just calls himself animal-based. But it does make me laugh because apparently orange juice, freshly squeezed orange juice is animal-based. That's what he said the other day. A banana is animal-based. He literally said these things. And it's like, well, actually, they're not. They're not animal-based. I can't see how that's animal-based. Anyway, right. Because you could pick anything up and go, well, I've got a big, big steak here. And I'm going to put it between two pieces of bread. So bread's animal-based. It, you know, it, I think it's, it's strange how he's, he's using terminology in such a way which is not really clear. But anyway, right. Sorry, Rich. You you finish and then I'll press end broadcast. Brilliant. No, th thank you all for listening again. Uh, super excited for uh, Dr. Kilts next week. Um, any questions, pop them below and we'll be sure to prioritize those. But thanks again. Um, this is us signing out and we'll see you next week. Bye.